It's so wonderful to have some new talent come join us. I really appreciate you joining us this morning. Ooh, you are worthy. I, I don't know. I think I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> Yesterday, we had the pleasure of having a baby shower here at the Center for Our Own Youth and Family Coordinator, Kay Allen. Did you know that she is due in early March? Wow, congratulations, Kay. She's in with our youth right now, and um, she's going to be going on maternity leave soon. And we do have uh, one volunteer who has offered to step up and help while she's on maternity leave, but we could use some other people. So if, if youth are... Uh, and children are something that you really enjoy. I'd love to hear from you. Mary, you could talk to me or Mary. We're looking for folks who'd be willing to volunteer one Sunday a month while Kay's on maternity leave. So, uh, you know, I'm hoping that inspires some folks who have been thinking that they wanted to get more involved with our, our kids. Uh, let us know. Thank you. We are kicking off this year with um, a grand rising. That is the theme for this year, for 2024. And the grand rising is really this idea that we start off each day knowing that we are worthy, to, to borrow some lines from your song, to, to knowing that we can rise tall and know who we are and walk out into the world as confident and s secure and authentic spiritual beings. And so it's a wonderful opportunity for us to, to really practice what we preach. We, we talk and have been teaching for 100 years now this philosophy of science of mind, this philosophy of awakening, of being conscious individuals, of walking out in the world and... Um, you know, I have found personally that this philosophy is the philosophy of individual healing first. There's, a, there's an individual that healing that, of healing that happens for each one of us, and, and we do a really good job with that. But there's a whole world. There's a whole world that needs that greater revelation of their worthiness and, and their... Uh, spiritual magnificence, if you will. And so I think that our philosophy is really maturing. We're evolving into a place where it's time for us to, to walk the talk, to be that... Um, my, one of my prayer partners used to tell me from time to time, she says, your healing consciousness is required <laughs> wherever you go. And I think that's true for each one of us, that as we, as we really begin to know who we are, right? Because this teaching is about remembering. It's about remembering who we are. It's time for us to remember who the rest of the world is as well and to ref and reflect that wherever we go. In addition to this wonderful theme of a grand rising, we are going through the first four chapters of the Science of Mind textbook, the... Um, this, this textbook was written by Ernest Holmes. A lot of this is um, talks that he gave that was further refined in 1938. It was a long time ago, <laughs> 1938. Um, and in those first four chapters, we have um, the, f the basic principles of what we teach. So in the first chapter, the thing itself, that's really absolute causation that everything comes from one cause. And, and sometimes we talk about it in simpler terms. We refer to that thing itself as the seed, that one idea that comes from consciousness, that comes from spirit, that comes from you, that we plant into what the second chapter is all about. The second chapter is the way it works. And in that second chapter, we're talking about the law. We're talking about how when we plant that seed in the soil of absolute law, then something happens to that. And what happens to that is the third chapter, <laughs> which is what it does. 
what it does is it begins to come to life. We plant that seed of thought into the fertile soil of the law, and it shows up in our world as manifestation and demonstration. And so those are the, the three basic principles of what we teach. It's, in essence, the creative process where we are working in co-creation with the divine to create a reality. Now, the fourth chapter, well, the fourth chapter is how to use it. And when we talk about how to use it, we're really talking about, um, let's call it gardening, right? <laughs> Call it gardening. Huh? We plant the seed in the soil of the, of the law. It brings forth a plant. And how do we work with that whole system of uh, working with cause and working with the law and, and, and creating the world that we experience around us? And, I th and, and then, uh, you know, the, the next evolution that we've been talking about a little bit over the last year or so, and I'm, we're going to talk about a lot more this year, is... You know, how do we take this teaching and create a world that works for all? Not only a world that works for you, but a world that works for everyone. Well, Holmes writes in the beginning of the chapter, one of the great difficulties in the new order of thought is that we are likely to indulge in too much theory and too little practice. Right? It's really easy to think about all these lovely ideas about the divine working through us and, and having those things that we want to experience in life come forward for us, wonderful ideas that we can um, cultivate, to use that gardening metaphor a little bit. Holmes goes on to say, as a matter of fact, we only know as much as we can prove by actual demonstration that which we cannot prove may or may not be true, but that which we can prove certainly must be and is the truth. So there's a reason we call ourselves uh, spiritual scientists or religious scientists. The reason we do that is because we are, we are always working with our thoughts and our, the conditions around us to, be, to cultivate and to create that which we want to bring forward. And what Holmes is saying in here is that there's a difference between playing with pretty ideas and knowing that you know that you know that you know. Mm -hmm. That line from your song again, being worthy, knowing that you're worthy, like waking up in the morning and it's not a second thought in everything you do throughout the day that you're worthy if it's any consolation, I haven't reached it yet either. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm still this uh, spiritual being having this human experience walking through life, you know, with other human beings. And so this is why we talk about and continue to look at these first four chapters. We continue to look at this philosophy. We continue to look at how we can evolve. What, what is it? You know, gardening is not just about planting. I've tried that. I've tried just putting seeds in the ground and watering them, and where's my plant? <laughs> it, it requires a little bit of gar uh, weeding, right? We have to cultivate the soil. We have to pull out the weeds. We have to find out what, if there's any obstructions in the soil, and those obstructions are sometimes our limited thought forms, our limited ideas that uh, we might be holding on to. And so when we, um, we look at this uh, first, uh, fourth chapter, Holmes also writes, who we are in, hmm, let me guess, let me start that one again. We are in this world and of it, and it is good that it is so. Who knows what would transpire if all humanity would speak the truth? It has never been tried. It has never been tried. All humanity has never tried speaking that truth, that a divine truth that we all know that is this, this existence that we have as human beings walking on the earth, that we are here to know love. And we are here to know all the different ways that love shows up. And in my world, 
there are a lot of things that I don't think love when I first see them. You know, I don't, I don't think love when I, when I see that guy at Costco with the sign saying he's hungry. You know, I, I feel some compassion. I feel some sadness. But it's hard for me to know that, that when I see someone who's suffering, that they're God-informed too. And I think when we are working with this teaching and these principles and we begin to really practice them and embody them, not just speak the pretty language, but to really know the truth, then we'll see the world from that truth. And we'll begin to know what's ours to do. Sometimes mine to do is to help somebody out. Maybe give some money out my car window. Sometimes what's mine to do is to take care of what's in front of me. But I have to listen to my heart and to know what's mine to do and to not get caught up in what I refer to as dehumanizing the other that I see who might be suffering because it's much or, or challenging me or angering me or saying things that I don't like or behaving in ways that I don't think are proper. That's when I get stuck in my human judgment and I get lost in what I think is right and wrong as opposed to knowing that there is one cause in the universe and that we each get to express it in so many different ways. In the Science of Mind textbook, when we, when we do this chapter, I have to read this one section because we're talking about our use of cause. We're talking about our use of uh, this spiritual philosophy. And um, Holmes writes this somewhat whimsical section on page 52. Those of you who know it by page 52, get ready, here it comes again. Hence it follows that if we believe that it will not work, it really works by appearing to not work. When we believe that it cannot and will not, then according to principle, it does not. But when it does not, it still does. <laughs> Only it does according to our belief that it will not. This is our own punishment through the law of cause and effect. So when we're working with this philosophy, what we have to understand is that the real work happens in our beliefs and our embodiment of truth. That for us to really be the living, walking, talking embodiment of this philosophy, it takes a little heavy lifting to go deep enough to know the truth for ourselves. I read this piece this morning on um, Facebook. I know it's not everybody's cup of tea, but it, it helps me keep track of all my friends. And um, it's, it was a piece written by Laura Lentz, and I want to read a little bit of it to you. And it's a little gritty, but when we talk about how to use it, I think, and, and how to take it out into the world, I think she, she really nails it. She writes, I was 19, and then I was 22. I was skinny and hot and steaming. And I was skinny and hot as the steaming coffee I drank black every morning from Jack's Deli. I had the gray fitted designer winter coat. Men turned when I passed construction sites and whistled and put down their hammers. I could dance to anything, salsas, the two-step improv, just put on the music and I was all in. I stole clothes from John Wanamaker and Saks Fifth Avenue and I had boots, bodysuits, one pound earrings. I danced to Donna Summer, Madonna, Blondie, <laughs> under disco balls, under the moonlight, in the black banana and Studio 54. The bouncer always called to me to the front of the line. They had nicknames for me and me for them. I sweat, I jiggled. I can't say that word here right now. <laughs> and I judged other women who couldn't dance, didn't have a sense of style, who ate too much, who were too fat, too loud, or too in love, or not in love enough, or were too old wearing too short skirts. What were they thinking? 
I was on top of the world, and I was with a man who loved the wild weed of me. And when, we, when he saw me judge another woman or another man or the male prostitute dressed like little Bo Peep who hung on my front steps leading up to my apartment, he would say things to me about the people I judged. He would say, look how beautiful she thinks she is. Or he'd say, baby, you don't know her story. Or he'd say, she's trying to get attention. Let's give her some. He dug through my closet while I was getting ready to go to dinner with him, and when I searched for my favorite green designer sweater with the pearl buttons, I us I'd usually find it on Little Bo Peep. And my man would say he was cold, and I gave it to him while it was you were in the shower. He'd buy me another sweater. I studied how he moved through the wintry world beside me. I watched him glide with grace and love and kindness and forgiveness and laughter. I saw something in him, and he saw something in me that nobody else saw, and I began to see it too. He saw my broken from my broken family and my potential to love the way we were all meant to love each other. He made love to me tenderly to heal my broken and sometimes with hunger to catch my insatiable desire to feel even more alive. He saw my potential to see, my potential to feel, my potential for empathy and kindness. He taught me how to love the two loud women checking out at the grocery store and the man who held up the plane and then demanded a different seat after we've all been waiting a half an hour. He taught me to love the taxi driver who took us to the opera, who had eight children who couldn't make his rent. We gave him our tickets, a night at the opera, and a check for what he would have made that night. Love is a verb and we practiced it together. As a fledgling in training, I discovered each of the persons that I had judged had a story I didn't know, and every person that I looked at or laughed at or decided who they were was me hiding from my own humanity. Because the truth is, it's sometimes hard to see. I began to see little Bo Peep, whose mascara was always streaking down his cheeks from crying, and I let him into my designer closet. I began to see all of the Jack at the Deli guys. Their gruffness was from the lack of sleep from taking care of his mother. Now, when I look back at that time, I understand I was with a man who was my spiritual guide, but he just looked like an electrician from Philadelphia who left hoagie, hoagie wrappers on the floor of his red Ford Bronco. The man I left... The man I loved left too soon, and his memory is still there every day to remind me to have compassion and not judgment, because you never know another person's heart until you stop and ask them about their life and listen. Chauncey launched me into the magnificence and complicated and tragic world with a heart that had eyes, and I wanted to say this morning that I see you and I want your story and I can receive your story and reflect your goodness and your beauty back to you as it was done for me. Because once you know how to love, nobody can take that from you. I read that story, that writing, and I didn't read it all. <laughs> Uh, there's more to it. Uh, she's an amazing writer, but sh what she's talking about is walking this talk. She's talking about loving the world as we see it, not the world we decide has to be right or wrong. We make all these little decisions all day long about what people should do and what people shouldn't do or what I should do or what you should do. Um, this uh, Chauncey the spiritual guide that she had in the form of her partner reminds me of my ex-husband, disguised as a carpenter in Baltimore, who was always kind and compassionate, who taught me how to get out of my own head and to open my heart, taught me how to love unconditionally. We all need Chauncey's and Jameses in our life, people who can remind us how to use it, 
how do we use this beautiful teaching that has set us free, that has opened our lives, so that we can see others in, from that same pair of eyes that has held us and has seen us for who we are. We can, there's a lot of really great information in that fourth chapter. I encourage you to read it. Holmes talks about act, taking action. Holmes talks about being you. Holmes talks about the need for us to, to walk this teaching out. It was maybe a simpler time in 1938 when that chapter was written. Maybe we just had less information. Maybe we really didn't know what was happening out in the world. Because I have to believe there have been people in our, on our planet who have been struggling and thriving and everything in between. And so for us to really do the gardening of our lives, it requires us to walk out in love, to see those places where our love is needed. And as my t-shirt says, pour your heart out. Allow the, the walls of your heart to come down long enough so that you can pour that beautiful love that has been so freely poured onto you out into the world. That's how we make and create a world that works for all. You don't have to know how we're going to solve all the world's problems. But you have to be willing, if you're interested in this prospect of a world that works for all, you have to be willing to be vulnerable, to share your love, to share your gifts and all the gifts that you've been given. How do we use this teaching? Well, sometimes we just have to let it use us. Sometimes we just have to show up. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Thank you, Jewel. So let's pray. Knowing that when we, when we speak the word, when we allow our minds and our hearts to open up to the allness of who we are, there is a power and a presence that is animating all of that. And so we turn our attention inward, knowing that there is indeed a power and a presence, a divine wisdom and intelligence that is available to each one of us. And so we move our consciousness, our awareness to that space within us that has never been harmed, that is completely whole, and we allow ourselves to know our own wholeness, our own worthiness. And it is in that knowing of our own wholeness and worthiness that we look out through the eyes of that wholeness and worthiness and we see it. We see it in the obvious places and we see it in the not so obvious places. And we allow ourselves to be inspired we trust God as it moves us forward so that we can be that place where God shows up as us. And so in this moment, I bless each one for the willingness to see the world in all of its grittiness and all of its beauty and all of its misunderstanding and all of its clarity and to allow our hearts to be open to, to allow the guardians of our vulnerability to step down so that we can be that full influx of spirit in the world this day so that we can know love so that we can be love, so that we can receive love. For it is a perfect circulation of energy that moves in as and through each one. And so I know as we move through this week, we continue to be open, open to 
our divinity as well as our humanity, knowing that it's all God. And it is with gratitude that I surrender this word, surrender this prayer back into the law from which it came, knowing that each one is served in their own unique way. I give thanks for this. And together we anchor this in love by saying, and so it is. <laughs>